Well, it is good to be with you today. Kelly sends her love. She um, had her first chemo treatment last Wednesday, um, has been doing pretty well, and um, uh, yesterday was a sleepy day, um, so hopefully today will be a little bit more alert. So that's going on. All the while, just to give you a little bit of a background, uh, we are, Dan has graciously given me some materials that we are diligently looking into with regard to diet. Uh, uh, Deb and Mark have given me something. I've got about three things. Now, if I were of above average intellect, I would have already digested them all. And so we are looking at alternatives uh, that would make this journey better. Uh, so I want you to know that. We, you know, we're fully into uh, do what you know to do. But I say that to say this. Our hope, is in the Lord. And we are looking to Him diligently, and I know that's where you all are as well. Thank you for your prayers. Kelly makes comments periodically. She knows that, that she is being prayed for, and we are. I got good news for you. I wanted to uh, give you an update. Remember, for the first two weeks, I battled to take hold of peace. It was a daily, sometimes hourly battle. But there was a night, I think it was Monday night, sometime... I don't remember when it was. It's a wash. But sometime in the middle of the night, I couldn't tell you how, couldn't tell you exactly when, but the peace of God that goes beyond understanding came upon me, just like Philippians 4, 6, and 7 promises. It covered my heart, it saturated my mind, and it has not left. You need to understand it's a real thing. Doesn't mean that circumstances don't punch at you once in a while, but they're no contest for the peace of God. Amen? Amen. Now, the other thing before I go into the Word today, uh, and we are going into the Word today, I'm giving you a little bit of my journey up front, but the Word today is part of my journey, and it's part of your journey. Uh, but before that, we had a most interesting thing take place this week. You know, Monday, we were going for our um, uh, appointment with the oncologist to hear the news, and I told you last week, I knew we needed to prepare ourselves so that earthly facts would not shake us from eternal truths. I'm not afraid to face what are physical facts, because there is a truth that overrides everything physical. Just read the Gospels. Watch Jesus, watch him walk on water, watch the miracles, uh, look at church history. Um, that was good, wasn't it? I say that to buy my time, me time because I forget what I was going to go to after that. So say, that was good. Now help this man, Lord. Oh, yes. Yes. And so we were preparing, and don't you love God whom Scripture says, and we find this to be true about him, he literally sends the answer ahead of the moment of need. Amen. And so before we're getting ready to go to the doctor, I talked to Melissa, our incredibly good friend, Kelly's best friend in the world, I think, and, uh, and she said, I had a strangest call into the office, into the church office. And so after we talked about it, I asked her to call the person and get a little bit more detail, find out, are they like, like for real or... You understand, some people are just weird and flaky. <laughs> and I want to know, are they real and are they part of God's team? <laughs> and uh, she did. And I want to read you just briefly, not all of it, but I think you will be encouraged by this. Remember, we're, say we're on a journey. So this is Melissa, our church administrator and good friend, who made these notes for me based on the message that was left in the church office on Friday. Everybody say, Friday is ahead of Monday. Friday. With good measure. When I came in this morning, I checked the messages, and there was a voicemail from Friday, uh, May 14th, 2021. 
from Linda Matthews in Redding, California at 1.50 p.m. I love details, and she knows I like details. She said, I'm kind of overwhelmed with the presence of the Lord right now. Today I was checking weather around the nation. Now, you've got to listen to this. Do, get out of your mind because this will not make sense to your mind. I was checking weather around the nation. My husband and I are called uh, to come on a journey across the country and have relatives in different places. But we're called on a journey. Today, while I was looking at the weather, the name Steve Watson appeared on my phone. It was the weirdest thing. I'll bet it was. <laughs> then it just disappeared. My husband said, don't you love being part of the 21st century church? My husband said, um, go on Facebook <laughs> and see what you see about a Steve Watson. So I did. So I did, and I happened to run across a video of Pastor Steve Watson and listen to the sermon. I guess it was from this past Sunday, the 9th. It's just so miraculous. I have a feeling that we're called to come there. We go to Bethel Church in Reading. We're in leadership. I've double-checked that. The miraculous is not new to us, but I'm just overwhelmed in my spirit. My husband was, was miraculously healed of ocular melanoma. We believe in healing. I didn't have any idea about this. Remember, she's leaving a voice message. But I don't know where you are. But I'm going to find out. We're going to go ultimately to Florida, come across to North Carolina. Our granddaughter is there. We're going to pick her up and search the region. Anyway, I'm going to hang up now and wait for a call back. We'll be leaving in about two weeks. Can somebody say God? Can somebody say God? When, when Melissa called and spoke to her for about 45 minutes, Melissa said, it was like waves of the Spirit hitting me. Wasn't it, Melissa, back there? This is true, isn't it? You ain't, you ain't making this up to make me feel better. <laughs> that's right. And the sister said, God wants you to know you're on his radar. Amen. Friends, listen. We are on God's radar. Amen. And she said, by the way, we have seen I can't remember, five or six, I, a, a large, I talked to her that evening, a large number of stage four cancers we have seen healed. Amen. So look at your neighbor and say, we're not in this alone. I want to repeat one thing and then we'll go into the word today uh, that I said last week. We are not immune from hard things hitting our lives. The difference between us and the world, those of us who belong to Jesus Christ, is we have resources available to us. They're unseen. You can't put your hands on them. But they're more real than that gray chair you're sitting in. The difference between you and me, those of us who are part of the kingdom and those of us outside of Christ, is that when we have things like this hit our lives, we have resources we can reach for and take hold of. Amen? Say this with me. We are the people of God. We are the people of God. One more time. We are the people of God. Amen. All right. Now, I want to move into the Word today. So don't charge me for that time. Look at your neighbor and say, that didn't count. He still has lots of time, and he preaches a long time. Well, here's the name of the message, the series. We're going to do, we're still in a new season, don't you, can't you tell? 
Last week uh, and the week, two weeks prior, we did a, we did a, a mini-series that I reserve the right to continue again later. It's like a television series with better reruns. <laughs> uh, but we're going to break out and we're going to do a mini-series of about three, maybe five sermons, I would say, uh, in the series is called Have the Faith of God. And today, uh, it's a catchy little uh, subtitle, Faith of God, can, ever, can you say question mark? Now, this is a bigger question mark in the body of Christ than I realize it was until I began to dive into the issue. There's an advantage to not having a theological education at a major institution. <laughs> and I have nothing against that, by the way. It's just the Lord knew in my naivety in my naivety, I wouldn't have survived it, faith intact. Some people can. My hat is off to them. I couldn't. So I have the advantage of approaching the Word of God as a naive child. I believe what it says. My first option is to believe exactly what it says. And I have found over 40 plus years that has served me well. So when I begin to study this, I, I want to, now I want to ask you to forgive me up front. Some of you may be bored for the first five or seven minutes. Get over it. You've been in much more boring services in the past. This will not be that bad. But I want to go into the scripture. This is what I want us to do. Uh, I, I, remember, remember the journey that we're on. I'm on, we're on together. Monday, uh, what, three weeks ago, uh, almost, we got the news. Um, Tuesday morning, I get up, and I go to my place where I sit with the Lord, and I knew, I just, I don't know how to explain it, I just knew, and that way the Lord plants a thought into your heart, into your mind, that I was to take up an old book that I had read a few times in the past called The Real Faith by this man, Dr. Charles Price. I had read the book, so I knew where the Lord wanted to take me, right? Now, the truth is, I ventured into the waters, but as Alan and I spoke yesterday, he made a statement that is so true. Um, the truth is, I would not even today choose to go into the waters that we're in. Even with my trust in the Lord, I'm sane, <laughs> I'm not crazy enough to say, Lord, take me into those deep waters. But I trust him enough when he kind of forces me into the deep waters to know that what lies ahead, what lies ahead are deeper revelation of the character of God, deeper revelation of the principles of the kingdom, than we, than I would have ever pressed into on my own initiative. You need to understand that. I, I am a man, as I said this morning, walking a fine tightrope above a canyon. I've never walked this before. I don't have any practice. And beneath me is nothing but absolute destruction. I would not choose to do that. But here we are. Now, I know this about God. He works all things together for the good of those who love him and are the called. And I know two things about me. I love him, and I'm called. I know two things about Kelly. She loves the Lord, and she's called. So we know that as we press into these deep waters, that this thing is going to work out for the glory of the kingdom of heaven. I can't tell you what exactly it'll look like or when, but when, it's, when the dust settles, Jesus will be honored and magnified. The kingdom will be advanced. Can you say amen to that? Yeah. This was the starting place the Lord had as he said, we're going on a journey. And I want to give you one quote that kind of captures the core of this book, of the message of this book. It's a somewhat lengthy one. Don't you like the way that I did it? So it looks like, um, isn't that good? That took about 20 minutes, but I've got a problem. You know, I, I, I've got issues. 
I know I have issues, and some of those issues end up making it look prettier than it would if I didn't have issues, right? So don't be impressed. Just say, Jesus, help this guy. He is like, what is wrong with him? But listen to this. Faith is living. It moves and operates and sweeps the enemies of the soul before its irresistible march. All the faith in the world? No! You need only as much as a grain of mustard seed. If it is God's faith, Then mountains will be moved, will be removed. But it must be God's faith. It must come from him. He must impart it, and he will. That captures this entire book, although I would encourage you to get the book, uh, The Real Faith by Charles Price. You can get the copy I've got, which is the older version, or they've updated it, The Real Faith for Healing. It's the same book, uh, just a little more updated. Now, this is what we're doing with this. You remember the Bereans in Acts 17, 11? Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So you need to understand, having received this journey um, assignment, Our job as noble-hearted believers is to now go into the Word of God to see if this thing that caused our heart to light up squares with the Scriptures. Okay, let's move on. Now, this is the passage that it comes from. That statement comes out of this passage. Mark 11, 20 through 24. As they passed by in the morning, remember, Jesus has cursed the fig tree, They saw the fig tree withered away to its roots, and Peter remembered and said to him, to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Now, how many of you know Jesus does not have anything against fig trees? But he does know a good teaching point when he can get one. So Jesus answered them and said, Have faith in God. Say that with me. Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, say therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it. We're going to look at that toward the end of today if we get there. And it will be yours. Now, I want to draw your attention. The most critical part of this passage is that statement, have faith in God. Now, this is the part I'm going to ask you, if you're bored with details, to hang on. Pinch your neighbor, entertain yourself. But some of you need to take this journey so that you will know this statement has integrity uh, that we're going to go into. Now, there is the Greek. What we have faith in God or have faith of God, there is the Greek right there. It's simply three words. Nobody argues about the first one. Everybody agrees the word is have. Nobody argues about the second one. Everybody agrees it's faith. The third one is the issue. Now, listen, I want you to hear something as plainly as I can say it. The Greek says of God. Nobody argues the point. Now, why am I making such a big deal? Let's go into this. I'm going to circle that. That's the word. It's the ending that what we see is an English U. There's another word, uh, letter it represents in Greek. That ending is what makes Theo, which is God, of. Now, let me say something. I've looked up the scriptures. If the writer wanted to say, have faith in God, there are very easy ways in Greek to write that. The word in in Greek transliterated is en. It would have been so easy to say, to write, have faith in God. Now, let's move on. That word, say, say this with me, T-H-E-O-U, because I I don't want to try to pronounce it, is used 30 times in the book of Mark. Say 30 times. times. 
Now, here's an interesting thing. I'm not picking on the KGV or the NAS. They were just the easiest for me to access. Uh, and they represent every major translation uh, that, that I've been able to come across, the 59 that I've looked at. Um, uh, all but seven of them translate this word, which is obviously, everybody agrees, the, 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 the literal translation is of God. It's always translated in God. But now look at this. Watch this with me. Let's go to court for just a minute. 30 times this word's used in Mark. 29 times it is, re it is rendered, I'm sorry, I did that wrong, in God. Oh, oh it renders it in God 29 times. I got excited and got ahead of myself. 29 times the KG renders it in God. Say that so you're not confused. In God. The NSA renders it in God 29, uh, 27 times, in God's time, two times. Now, I'm, I'm getting myself confused there. Do you get the point? Yes. We need to see this. Why would that happen? There's only one reason. The Scripture is approached from a theological standpoint first. Say this with me. We cannot allow our theology to dictate the reading of Scripture. Of 59 English translations, 52 render Mark 11, uh, 22, have faith in God, and only seven follow, uh, render it literally. The uh, contemporary Jewish Bible says it this way, have the kind of trust that comes from God. The DRA renders it, have the faith of God. The Geneva New Version renders it, have the faith of God. The RGT, have the faith of God. The Wycliffe, have ye the faith of God. The young literal uh, translation, have faith of God. And may, may the Passion Translation be honored and praised here today. Let the faith of God be in you. Now, the reason that's important to you is more important to me than to you. If I were making these statements based on my understanding of Scripture against every translation, I would not trust myself. But we're not out there on our own. The Scripture is plain. Say this with me. Have faith of God. Have faith of God. Oh, I didn't finish. I told you. Get bored. Some of you get bored. It's used 239 times in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. I hope I didn't screw this part up. Uh, the, the King uh, James translates it uh, uh, of, uh, in, uh, of God one time. Yeah, I mess, I got them crossed. Of God one time. And the NSA does the same thing. You can tell I did those late at night. One time. Somebody say 239 times. And ask this question, why would you shift... Why would you shift in one case and one case only? The reason this is important is we're pushing against a theological bulwark that has got to come down. Because you and I will never be able to generate enough faith in God to move one mountain. That's right. Unless we discover the reality of our need to have an impartation of the faith of God 
so that when we speak to a mountain, we're speaking not with what we have generated, but what has been given to us. It's God. It's, it's God's its own loan to us. Why make such a big deal out of one word? Anybody recognize the skyline of this city? Charlotte. Come on, Charlotte, we're big time. Now, if my, if my estimation is right, it would take me anywhere from 12, but probably around 14 hours to walk to Charlotte. So if somebody told me this morning that I had to be in Charlotte for something critical at 2 o'clock and my cars were broken, unavailable, how foolish would it be for me to start walking hoping that somehow I could <laughs> break through? I mean, wouldn't that be dumb? Now tell me what would be smart. Call somebody that has what? A car. If I want to get to Charlotte, a 14-hour walk, and I don't have a car, I need a vehicle that will get me there in an hour. Do you understand what I'm saying? How foolish it is for us to try and try and try and then try a little bit harder to take hold of the promises of God with what we can generate when what we need to do is focus our energies on one thing. Didn't Jesus say, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest? Take my yoke upon you, uh, upon you and learn from me, for I'm humble and, and, uh, and meek, and, and, and you'll find rest for your souls, and you'll also find answers to your needs. So let's think about Matthew 7. I'm going to do this in the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the disciples' uh, literal New Testament. But I want us to think about this for just a moment and think about the way we pray. Now let's think about um, how many have a mountain in your life right now. Let's think about what we're talking about from this perspective. Be asking and it will be given to you. What do you need? Healing. Okay. Be asking and it will be given to you. What vehicle do you need to take hold of healing? The faith of? The what? The faith of God. Be asking so it's important what we're asking for. That's the point. You understand? Uh, be seeking and you will find. Be knocking and it will be open to you. For everyone asking receives. And the one seeking finds. And to the one knocking it will be opened. Or what person is there from among you who his son will ask for bread? He will not give him a stone, will he? Will he? Will he? This is rhetorical. Really? Really? Please? Or indeed, he asked for a fish. He will not give him a snake. Will he? Will he? Therefore, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in the heavens give good things to the ones asking him? Now, what I have discovered about my life and perhaps yours is because of the journey, there are some things I don't know how to call it. I don't know what to say about it. I, I don't have the language for all of this. But there seem to be some things that along my journey in life, I, I, can't, I don't even want to say I've cultivated. God's cultivated everything in me. But there are things I seem to be able to go to the Lord directly for and ask him, I need this, Lord. I need you to answer this. And I have faith for that. But listen, the issue at hand are not the uh, run-of-the-mill things that we daily have need of. 
We're talking about mountains that have got to be moved. The direct ask for a mountain that needs to be moved is not necessarily for the mountain to be moved. It's that you would have an encounter with Jesus and he would part faith to you so that you can speak to the mountain. Can you see that? Does that, is that messing with your theology today? I mean, I hope it does. I hope it messes with it uh, if it needs to be messed with. Because this is high-stakes stuff that we're working on. So why make such a big deal out of one little word? I want to give you one more quote from the real faith to kind of entice you. Uh, listen to this. You simply cannot believe without the alloy of doubt until you have the faith of God. It takes God's faith to clean up these human hearts of ours, of all the debris, the fears, misgivings, and doubts. Now, here's an important question to ask as we're doing this journey together. Is have the faith of God consistent with key faith passages? Well, let's look at the, what I consider the three most important faith verses in the New Testament. The first is this. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. So I want to ask you something. Is this idea of a faith that is God's that needs to be imparted to us so that it can now, something we take hold of, is that, does that square with Ephesians 2.8? By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the what? It is the gift of God. So I think you would agree with me that that verse comes into alignment very well with this idea of we need an impartation of God's faith. As Alan said this morning in his teaching, he got born again uh, as, a, as a young man in a camp. Well, listen, that wasn't his faith. Well, technically it was, but he didn't generate it. And neither did you generate your faith. I was a solid, unbelieving human being before the moment that I received an impartation of the faith of God to believe that Jesus was my Savior and that I could respond to him. Now, Colossians tells us, as you begin in Christ, so walk you in him. In other words, as you entered this life, you have established a pattern that you'll follow for the rest of your journey with the Lord. And what I think we need to understand is we are more dependent on him than we ever realized. But let's look at another one. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Is that consistent with this idea of uh, an impartation of God's faith being necessary? Well, certainly. What is the vehicle that God uses to cause faith to generate in our hearts? It's the rhema. We'll look at that perhaps in just a moment. It's the rhema. We've looked at that over and over again. So something happened. I mean, I, I, I had heard the word preached many times before that, uh, that uh, wonderful night at Stony Point Baptist Church when suddenly it all came alive. <laughs> I mean, I had been, I'd sit under the word many times. But I do not ever remember an encounter with God that left salvation so absolutely certain if I would say yes. Right? What happened? Jim Carraway, the brother who was preaching that night, I don't have an idea what he preached on. I remember he was a rotund man who played the piano beautifully. And something he said made me get up out of my chair and walk to the front almost involuntarily. It was that powerful. So I will grow to go to my grave defending that God is responsible for my salvation. 
The only part I played is I did not run in the process. So yes, so I think we could agree. This idea of a faith of God needs to be imparted. One of the most essential scriptures in the New Testament regarding faith comes into alignment with that. And think about this one. Now faith is the, in the Greek, literally, the title deed of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. Now how many of you have been like me and you've had moments of hoping for something and then almost inexplicably, without question supernaturally, something shifted. That which you were hoping for in that moment, you actually somehow knew it was done. What happened? See, when we receive the faith of God, what we are receiving is a title deed. We are receiving in our hearts an ownership of the, th of the th we're, we're receiving an ownership. We can now speak to the mountain and, and say, you be removed and cast into the sea because that mountain has now come under our authority. Prior to that moment, it wasn't under our authority, but we just received a title deed from God. God has given us an impartation of his faith. How many of you believe that God can speak to any mountain and say, move, and it will move? Amen. How many of you know God can speak to the thin air and say, mountain be, and it will be? Amen. How many of you know that God is the God? This is what the Bible says about his faith. He's the God who calls things as the, uh, that are not as though they are. <laughs> And then they be. That's right. So when we're talking about an impartation of God's faith, that's what we're talking about. And it's a real thing. We read the biographies of saints of old and marvel at Smith Wigglesworth. What was happening in this radical man? He had learned how to tap into the faith of God. And he would speak to corpses with the faith of God. I mean, and that's why I remember that one. I mean, this is crazy. I'm thinking, Jesus, that brother would have been locked up, put away if he were in USA today. I can't help but remember that one famous story where uh, somebody had died and they said, I'm sorry, they're, they've already dead. And he went in and he, and he took the corpse and he spoke to it and it didn't move. So he took the corpse, pushed it up against the wall and said, live! <laughs> you know what happened? It lived. it lived! What had just happened? Wigglesworth had an impartation. I wonder, I mean, he was a bold guy, but I, I wonder how many times after the fact he went, oh, dear God, what did I say? Because <laughs> isn't it true that we will declare things in a moment of faith that we'll shudder at on the other side of that moment? Why? It wasn't your faith. You didn't work it up. You tapped into heaven. You tapped into God's faith, right? Now, I want you to think about this with me. Just, just a moment. Um, this is a Bible. It's a printed Bible. It, the Bible doesn't only come in PowerPoint. I wanted to make that observation today. I'm, a, I'm appreciative to the Bible and PowerPoint. I, I thought, I didn't put this in there, but I thought I would like to go back to the kind of the, I mean, Paul made a big deal about Abram, didn't he? And Abram being the pattern. So I thought maybe we would examine this idea of the faith of God uh, and see if, if Abram squares up with any of these things right here. So in Genesis chapter 15, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But God said, but Abram said, O oh God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. 
And behold, I want you to watch this. Some of you aren't watching, so I'm going to stand up on the chair. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. Say, Behold. Behold. The word of the Lord came to him. And here's the rhema. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven and number the stars. If you are able to number them, then he said, So shall your offspring be. And here we have it. One of the most important verses in all of the Bible. And he, Abram, believed the Lord. And he counted it to him as righteousness. Let me ask you, who took the initiative? Who spoke the word? Ultimately, how much credit does Abram get? No, that's the whole point, isn't it, of Paul's writings in the New Testament. Abram, too, entered into his promise by grace through faith. And it was not his own generated faith, but a gift of God. Listen, look at it through the lens of the old. Look at it through the lens of the new. This idea that there is a faith of God available to be imparted to the people of God so that they can speak to mountains that otherwise could never be moved and say, be removed and be you planted, literally in the Greek, in the sea. Can somebody say, Yes and amen to that. Amen. Four people are excited, and I'm, I consider that an incredible gain today. Victory, victory, victory. Now think about this with me for a moment. I'm about done, so just relax. Everybody say relax. Remember, those first few minutes didn't count. I'm going to run the clock up to, to, to 12, and it will be done. Not that that matters. I reserve the right to go to whenever I want to go to. <laughs> But think about that. We're looking at the New Testament. Now think about John 15, 6b through 7. Now, thanks be to God, I called out about five slides here for your sake. You can do nothing without me. Can somebody say, Jesus said that? Now, I've looked up in the Greek, and it actually means nothing. Now, I don't know about you, but I count believing as something. Don't you count believing as something? So Jesus is saying, you can do no believing without me. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, we'll look at this more detailed maybe next week. Ask whatever you want, and it will be done for you. Now watch that a little bit. Let's see if this is consistent. If, everybody say if. Yes. Say the biggest little word in the, in the Bible. Yes. If you remain in me. We'll look at this in more detail, but this is what I want to draw your attention to. And my words remain in you. Now, I want you to see something. It doesn't say, if you remain in me, ask what you want. If you're going to read the Bible, read the whole Bible. If you're going to believe the Bible, believe the whole Bible. If you remain in me and, I've looked up in the, in the Greek, K-A-I is the transliterated word for and. It is there. And, say and. and. Say and. And. <laughs> And my, let's pop it up here, rhema, that which is or has been uttered by the living voice. Now, one of the slides I spared you from, somebody might say, well, the Lord could be using that for his teaching. 
Well, if you go back and read John 15 from verse 1 on, you will find that Jesus has already used the word logos once. If he wanted to talk about his teaching, he would have used logos a second time, which speaks to the body of teaching. This is a very specific word chosen against the backdrop of logos, his teaching, his body of teaching. What Jesus is saying here, remember he said in that place, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Rhema, say rhema. rhema. See, we got to get this through our head. I cannot memorize enough of the Bible to move mountains. Now, memorizing the Bible might set me up for an encounter with God who will speak that word into my heart, but I'm still dependent on him. Why? I can do nothing without him. I can't memorize myself into enough faith without him. I can't grunt till I have enough faith. It'd be easier to lay an egg, if you can imagine that than to try to produce faith. You can do nothing without me if you remain in me and my words remain in you. Ask whatever you want. We're going to look at that next week. And it will be done for you. I've looked into Greek. He means it. May the Lord be thanked for the Passion Translation. Though it is a paraphrase, it is a darn sweet one. Isn't this beautiful? But if you live in life union with me, and if my words, Rhema, live powerfully within you, then you can ask whatever you desire, and it will be done. See, I tell you, the Lord Jesus gave us some strong, meaty phrases in the Gospels. He said outrageous things, like you'll do works greater than I've done. He said unbelievably outrageous things, like you'll be able to speak to mountains and they will move. I mean, have you you ever read the Bible? He said ridiculous things. Why did he say them? Because he knew throughout the history of the church, there would be people who wouldn't settle for less than to see the reality of those promise, those promises displayed before the earth so that his name would be glorified. And Jesus answered literally, Karen, if you guys will come, this is, uh, everybody say, may the Lord be praised. This is the last slide. (laughs) This is a more literal reading of Mark 11, 22 through 23. I tell you what I'm doing. I told you I have issues. I do have issues. They seem to work to my advantage many times, so I'm not asking the Lord to take them away. But I am, I've been on a quest. I have been on a quest. I have been working my little badoodles, batoozle off. In the mornings I get up and I go get the word. And I am tearing down every one of those outrageous sayings of Jesus. I'm looking to understand every Greek word and every nuance. And I'm looking to understand the grammar behind it. Uh, Do you understand? I'm telling you, when he said seek and you'll find, I'm taking him up on this. When he said knock and the door will be open, I'm saying, God, can you hear me knocking again today? Because i got to understand what that says. My wife's life depends on me getting that revelation. That will make you press into God. So this is somewhat literal. This is actually, 
This lines up literally. And Jesus answered them, have the faith of God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and be thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart. Why? How is that humanly possible? It's not. unless you have received an impartation of the faith of God. And then you want me to tell you what you will do? In the early morning hours, before the servants have, ar have, 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 have ar ar arose or arose or got up from their bed, <laughs> you will hear the voice of the Lord saying, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him to me there. When you've had the faith of God imparted to you, there's no recording of struggle. There's no recording of a dialogue with God, but God, don't you understand? There is a simple, probably pained, maybe dazed and confused, but having received an impartation of God's faith through your son, you make the trick, tr track up the mountain and does not doubt in his heart. Say this with me. With man, with man. That, is that is not possible. But with God, with, God. with his faith, it's true. But believing, but is believing, the Greek is, is believing that this shall be, he shall have it. Friends, listen. I close with this today. We are on a journey. It is not a journey that any one of us would have chosen. Frankly, none of us would choose today. But our God seems to trust us to take a journey into deep waters. I'm convinced that on the other side of this, whatever my personal life may look like, and listen, my, my water is rising like a flood in terms of faith for that, right? I know this. I tell you, I know this. I think this might be the faith of God. I'm not sure. I do know this. In the days to come, this will be a church of people who know how to move in the faith of God. Amen. And people will come from states far away because there is a mountain that must be moved and only a people who understand and have surrendered to the God of all faith will be a conduit. I want to ask you today. I'm on a journey. I didn't get a choice. You do. You have a choice. Will you go? Will you push? Will you walk with the Lord? Will you open up your heart and let theology that is contrary to sound truth fall to the ground in your heart and in your mind? Will you believe that there is a God in heaven who can empower people on the earth with his faith and fulfill the bold, radical declarations of Jesus Christ. Will you go on that journey? Alan, I'm going to, if you don't mind, leave that with you, and I want to go see, where, where's Charlie? Oh! Excuse me, Alan, will you take this? I've got a little grandson to go look at. Manna? 
You want to go with me? You want to stay with Dad? I don't blame you. Do you want to give Dad your drumsticks? Daddy, I want to go. <laughs> yeah. Say hey to my friends, Say hey. Say my name's Charlie. Say hey invite you today if you would like to come up and pray if you'd like for someone to pray with you we're here to pray with you if you'd like uh, to be baptized you see uh, Michael right up here and uh, if you'd like to be baptized today 
any type of prayer perhaps that you might need or like, we do invite you to come up. And uh, so may the Lord be with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May you be blessed this week mentally and physically and spiritually. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you.